Hello, I'm Raymond Douglas. I am Professor of Surgery and the Director of the Orbital and Thyroid Eye Disease Program at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And today, joined by Dr. Andrea Kostler, the Director of Occupational Plastic and Orbital Surgery and Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the Byers Institute at Stanford University School of Medicine in Palo Alto. Welcome, Andrea. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. Today, we'll be discussing the benefits and risks of the IGF-1 receptor therapy or insulin-like growth factor 1 receptor therapy in the treatment of thyroid eye disease. And I know, Andrea, you are an expert on this, and so look forward to the discussion. Well, it's, it's always great talking to you, Ray. So I am looking forward to this discussion and from learning from each other. We'll dive right in. Tepratumumab is still a novel drug, but with its FDA approval, where do you see the value in using it, considering the benefits versus the risks of this type of therapy? Well, that's a great question. And I think that the answer to that question really depends. And it, it kind of, I think different people have different opinions. My opinion was different a couple of years ago than it is now. And I, I think I will maybe even continue to change my opinion as we continue to get more long-term studies. But I think what we can all agree on is that tepertivimab is effective in the properly selected patient. And the properly selected patient is the most important part of that term. We know that the pivotal trials that you led um, so clearly demonstrated that tepertivimab is effective in patients with active, moderate to severe thyroid eye disease. And since its approval in January of 2020, there's been many studies that have supported that and have also supported that the drug can be effective in other phenotypes and stages and phases of disease. We know that it can decrease muscle size and even help patients that have compression of their optic nerve. And in a more recent study, we know that patients that have had long duration and low inflammatory disease, it can even work on, on them too. 62% of patients have improvement in proptosis at 24 weeks follow-up. So we know that the drug can be infect, effective in many patients. But for me, I think the sweet spot is really those active progressive moderate to severe patients that are properly selected and screened. So I want to make sure that I'm really thinking about patient selection. I'm asking my patients about risk factors to IGF-1 inhibition, such as diabetes or hearing loss, inflammatory bowel disease. And on every patient, I weigh the risks and the benefits according to their own customized disease. And I take into account the severity and the activity of their disease as well as potential risks to treatment. And I think that as long as we educate our patients and screen them properly, we can surely treat patients safely and um, we can also treat them effectively. And, and you mentioned uh, efficacy. Um, looking at the efficacy of other therapies, such as steroids, biologics, and even radiation for TED patients, how does tepratumumab compare uh, in the ability to reduce disease burden? Yeah, another great question. I think it's important to remember that tepertivimab is really only available in the United States and Brazil, and I, I know that that is expanding. So across the world, people are still using uh, other treatment options for tepertivimab, and there, there are other treatment options. That's important to remember. Again, it's important to just customize our treatment and to really think about what's happening to our patients on a molecular level so that we can really tailor our treatment to the patient's individual disease but I think that when you consider the studies for all of the different treatment options, tepertivimab has demonstrated more superior efficacy when it comes to the overall picture of thyroid eye disease. And so it's demonstrated that it can improve inflammation and proptosis and double vision and quality of life. But again, it all depends on selecting the proper patient. I think it's reasonable, particularly when patients are not good candidates for tepertivimab, or perhaps they just don't have access to tepertivimab, it's reasonable to treat with steroids if patients have inflammatory predominant disease. As we know, steroids can help inflammation. And it's reasonable to treat with radiation if you have that really early active patient and you can stop that you know, fibroblast activation. So I think these other treatments are reasonable, but their studies did not demonstrate the same level of durability or proptosis reduction as tepertivimab. So I think, again, in the properly selective, especially the active moderate to severe patients that are progressing, uh, for me, tepertivimab is the most effective one at decreasing proptosis, improving double vision, 
improving inflammatory signs, and at least in the short term results that we currently have, since it's a relatively new drug, I would say that one is uh, the more effective one at decreasing disease burden. Right. And you mentioned a bit about safety, and so we can expand upon that. I'd love you to, if you could tell us a little bit more about the safety data on Tepatumab, and specifically how clinicians can navigate the management of adverse effects, and you know, including the muscle spasms, hyperglycemia, and hearing changes. I think that the safety data for Tepatumab has become a really hot topic. You know, I'd say in the last year to two years. Um, I think at first we knew that it worked, and then it, it took us some time, I think, to better understand these safety questions. I think that the two pivotal studies, again, that were done and published in the New England Journal of Medicine did a really nice job of documenting the adverse events to a very high level of accuracy when it comes to the types of adverse events that should be expected with tepratibumab. And you mentioned the muscle spasms and hyperglycemia, hearing changes, and perhaps inflammatory bowel disease exacerbation. But in the clinical studies, these studies are, are intentionally created to, uh, to select patients carefully and to have a carefully curated group of patients that have well-managed Graves' disease and well-managed other diseases like hyperglycemia, et cetera. But in you know, the real world, patients come with all levels of uh, comorbidities and risk factors and levels of disease control. So what we've learned now after FDA approval and after the, the nicely done clinical studies is that while the AEs are very similar as far as which ones we're seeing attributed to tepratibumab, the percentage of AEs just happens to be higher. And in a study that we recently published in ophthalmology, and actually you and I did the study together with many of our colleagues, we looked at 131 patients treated with tepratibumab, and we found that about 80% or so had tepertibumab-related AEs. And it's interesting, patients, they're either gonna get the AEs or they're not. You know, 20% don't get anything, and then the other 80% get several. And we found that muscle cramps was the most common AE, but we found that it was closer to maybe 60% of patients experiencing them. And GI symptoms like diarrhea was common, but uh, you know it was higher than in the clinical studies. And similarly, hearing changes were finding is higher than what was reported in the clinical studies from 10% in the clinical studies to about 30% kind of in a more real world population. So I think that what we're learning about tepertibumab is that it's effective, but that patients are likely going to experience adverse events. And it's our job to screen them, to educate them, to monitor them, and to work really hard to treat them safely. And um, and I think that if we can develop protocols and a team to do that, I still think that we can treat our patients safely, but we have to know when to say no. We have to know when a patient is not a good candidate. And we also have to know how to screen them and how to hold treatment if necessary and to treat our patients with a team that can address all of the different potential manifestations of their adverse events. The other final thing that I'll say is that the majority of the adverse events are mild to moderate and reversible. And so we wanna make sure that we are monitoring them to prevent patients from developing the more severe adverse events that are potentially not reversible. So we still have to learn about it, but if we are careful, I think that we can navigate this uh, safety very well. You spoke a little bit about um, working as a team in a multidisciplinary or interprofessional team. Um, to effectively manage these patients. Maybe you could you know, speak to a little bit more um, definitively as far as how this may work or even works in your practice as far as referral, monitoring, and care plans. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really important question and a really important thing to discuss because I always consider thyroid eye disease a team sport. And I, I teach my residents that. And I, I think that because this is a systemic autoimmune disease with many systemic manifestations, it's certainly not just the eyes, uh, we really do need to treat our patients with a multidisciplinary team. And so what we do is, is we have, you know, I have my partner, my endocrinology partner, Dr. Christy Docio, and we treat our patients together. And she's the expert when it comes to treating their Graves' disease and, and many of the systemic um, manifestations and some of the adverse events that come with all of our treatment options. But also, it's important to work with, let's say, an ENT doctor that specializes in hearing changes 
a GI doctor that specializes in GI changes. And so it's just important to have a team that understands this disease, that understands the implications of our different treatment options, and that can help us to treat our patients safely. So we have a protocol where every patient that we see is seen by an endocrinologist and ophthalmologist, they get the same baseline labs for every patient. And then of course, depending on patients, they might get additional testing. And that includes a hearing test and checking their hemoglobin A1C and checking their TSI and their BMP. And then we repeat those labs throughout their treatment and even after treatment. I also ask every single patient at each visit about any potential adverse events. And I also ask them about any potential ER visits, hospitalizations, or visits to their PCP to better understand and to ensure that I am monitoring for any potential adverse events that could be related to treatment. And I refer when necessary to my colleagues so that we can co-manage. And I have a low threshold to hold or to discontinue treatment. In, in much of what you were discussing, um, you know, really is about an educational process with the patients, letting them know what they can expect. And what what else can we do to educate our TED patients about treatment options, um, but also about adverse events and informed consent to undergo these treatments? Well, there's been a lot of talk about informed consent, actually, considering some of the uh, adverse events that have been reported with tepertibumab and other drugs that are used to treat thyroid eye disease. And for me, informed consent is more than signing a paper. It's really a conversation and it's really a conversation where I feel that the patient is understanding the adverse events and I feel that the patient will partner with me in making sure that we are monitoring these patients for these adverse events. And it it kind of takes a village. So I've trained my staff as well as the patient um, so that we can educate our patients together. So if a patient calls uh, with some type of complaint, my, my staff knows what that could potentially mean. So we give all of our patients educational materials regarding the different treatment options for thyroid eye disease and their adverse events. I, of course, sit down and explain to them the adverse events associated with this treatment option. And I talk to them about the importance of alerting us to any adverse events that they may notice. Sometimes patients don't want to tell you because they're scared that you're going to stop their treatment. But it's so important because I think that if we know about adverse events, we can work them up and we can sometimes treat them. And so it's just important to educate your patient and your team and to make sure your patient is understanding why you're doing these extra tests, why it's important for them to follow with you. And the final thing that we, we've now started doing, which I think is very effective, is that my infusion center and my team know that a patient cannot start therapy until they've completed their baseline and their screening tests. That way I feel more comfortable that I'm not treating the wrong patient that might have a baseline risk factors for adverse events um, unnecessarily. So those are the things that have worked in my clinic. And I feel very comfortable treating with tepertibumab with all of these safeguards in place. So, you know, I'm continuing to learn from our patients and, and continuing to understand what the best proper uh, patient selection is. Um, but I think the most important thing that we can really do is admit that we don't know everything, that we educate our patients, we involve them in the decision making, and we study all of these things so that we can really learn how to uh, pick the best treatment options, pick the best patients, and have great efficacy and outcomes. Great. And just if you can leave us with any um, any thoughts that you want as a take-home message or uh, a look toward the future as far as uh, some of your insights. Well, when I first, uh, you know, when I first started uh, treating patients with thyroid eye disease, we didn't have many treatment options. We had steroids or radiation and then a myriad of other steroids-bearing agents. and And it was a bit frustrating to not have good treatment options for patients. So I think what's most exciting is that tepertibumab is the first step to huge, huge changes in the way that we treat patients. And it's an important, very important step. We finally have targeted therapy that's effective. And what's exciting for me is that when I used to only had have nonspecific treatments for this disease, I now have a targeted therapy, but dozens of additional other targeted therapies that are currently being studied and investigated. So I just think that the future of thyroid eye disease treatment is really bright. And I think that 
when we have this conversation again in you know five years or so, we'll have so many additional treatments that are not just targeting the IGF-1 receptor, which is, is very important, but perhaps targeting this disease in many different ways. So I think it's just an exciting time for us and for our patients. And I think that we are going to have many, many effective and safe treatment options in the near future. Well, thank you, Dr. Kostler, for an excellent discussion as always, and really appreciate our chats. Um, thank everyone for listening. And please remember to take the post-test and evaluation to receive your CME credit, and also to tune in for additional episodes within the podcast series. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ray.